Welcome, welcome. I'm so happy we were able to come here this Friday, even though we couldn't last Friday. Um, I'm sorry about that, but we had ice and we were worried. So just so you know what's going to be happening, we've transferred our database to MailChimp, which is a completely different system. We have a couple of little quirks, but overall, it's really going well. It is an email-based system. So if we do not have your email and you have one, make sure members, you, you give it to us so that we can make sure you get the emails we send out on Thursday, which give you the Zoom link and also tell you what the speaker is for the next day. I also want to suggest that you look at your emails on Friday morning, because what if we had an unexpected storm or a speaker is sick or there's no heat in the church or heaven only knows what we would tell you by 11 a.m you would get that email it will also be on our website for those of you who are members and non-members so you could check our website that morning i would say by 11 last week it was on next to the date where of the lecture in red it said zoom only so you would be able to see that um we're hoping we don't have any of those issues anymore. No more snow on Fridays. No more minus 50 wind chills on Fridays. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, so we're very excited today to have Dr. Dupini Duru. And I've been practicing how to say this. She's laughing at me. She's giving me two thumbs up, this nice lady. I've got to get my glasses, which of course I probably left over here. Do I have them on my head? Yes. <laughs> All right, I want to read a little about her. Um, she's spoken to us a few times before, but maybe you hadn't seen or heard her. An applied climatologist by training, Dr. Dupini Giroux's research interests intersect a number of interdisciplinary fields, including hydroclimatic, natural hazards, and climate literacy geospatial climate and land surface processes, all within the context of our changing climate. And we do have that, you know that. Dr. Dupini Giroux has served on the Vermont State Climate, no, has served as the surface processes all within the context of our changing climate. She has served as the Vermont State Climatologist since 1997 and is the immediate past president of the American Association of State Climatologists. In 2020, she was appointed by the Vermont House of Representatives to the Vermont Climate Council as the member with expertise in climate change science. She continues to work with Vermont state agencies and municipalities in their planning for and adapting to climate change. She is an expert in floods, droughts, and severe weather and the ways in which these affect Vermont's landscape and people. She has worked extensively with K through 12 teachers and students, bringing the use of satellites, climatology, and climate change to all levels of the pre-university curriculum. She is the lead editor of Historical Climate Variability and Impacts in North America, the first monograph to deal with the use of documentary and other ancillary records for analyzing climate variability and change in the North American context. Nationally, Dr. Dupini Giroux was involved, was invited by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Program to be a presenter on the climate science leading the way panel at the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, Scotland in 2022. She served as the lead author for the Northeast chapter of the 2018 Fourth National Climate Assessment of the U.S. Global Change Research Program and is an author on the National Water Chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment. Wow. <laughs> so without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Dupini Giroux. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And it's always such a pleasure to be back here at Triple E, um, even though it's a little bit cold outside. And I know I was warned not to talk about chills too much, but thank you for being here. Is everybody hearing me okay? I have two layers on, so I'll take off one layer. <laughs> a little bit better? Okay, so I have a, a really low voice. And if at any time it gets even lower than usual, just wave at me. So if I see the entire audience doing like this, 
it's because you're, you're you're not saying like great things are happening. It's because you're not hearing what I'm saying. Okay, so feel free to, to wave at me at, at any point in time. So today what I thought I would do, since I think it's my third or fourth time being in the, the Triple E family, and you've probably seen some of my slides before, I have to mix things up a little bit just to keep you on your toes. So there's some things that are happening in the news, there's some things that are happening in Vermont, and I thought we'd try and, and bring all of this in to, to look at how climate change is sort of playing out across the state and what, what can we think about doing and, and some of those pieces, okay? And most recently, I've gotten uh, really, really interested in the, the people's first approach and how do we think about who's at the table, who's not at the table? How do we think about human vulnerability? How do we think about uh, who are vulnerable populations? And so those are some of the things that we're gonna be talking a little bit about today, not just the, the climate as a science, but how climate climate change and weather patterns affect us as humans um, and, and how we affect the, the landscape around us. So some of the things that we're gonna be looking at. So this is hot off the press. So today is Friday, the 24th of February, 2023. And did you know that last month, January of 2023, was actually the warmest January since 1895 here in Vermont? Did you know that one? Okay, so this this is this is like we got cutting straight to the the chase here. Okay, and so we were among uh, a lot of other New England states in setting that that record for last month being the warmest January since 1895. So here's a, a graph, and if I try and move my mouse, is everybody seeing the mouse moving? Okay, okay. So here's here's a graph that shows you the 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 January temperatures. And it starts off in 1895. Everybody see that? Okay, right? And here we are in 2023. And this is the, the highest this, this record here. Okay. So as you're looking at this graph, a couple of things I wanted to point out. You see that there have been other Januaries that have been particularly warm, right? And then you see that there are other Januaries in the recent past, so like in the recent decades or so, that have been particularly cold. OK, and we know that in Vermont, we can go from high to low and high to low. And that's that variability that we talk about. And, you know, it's, it's one thing that we always say when you get into the elevator. What do you talk about if it's not hockey? It's, it's the weather or the climate. Right. And so there's always something to talk about, always something to learn about our climate here in the state. And think back a little bit further than January. Think back to Christmas time last year when we had that bone chilling and really, really blizzard type conditions. Everybody remember back that far? Okay. And, and so what you're seeing here are, are blues represent really cold conditions. And you see how far south that, that went. And then reds represent where it's warmer conditions. Okay. So look, look at that. There's a, a weak difference between around Christmas time on the left-hand side here and getting close to New Year's on the right-hand side. And you see we've, again, flipped that switch between being cold around Christmas and then being almost record warm close to New Year's, all right? And so you're probably thinking right off the bat, what was happening? What are we looking at here? Why is this occurring? And what, what I'm gonna play for you is, is a, a video that shows you the, the movement, you know about the jet stream, right? the jet stream that separates where the cold air is from where the, the warm air is, right? And what you're gonna see is that jet stream kind of moves around and how it moved around in the month of December last year, okay? So I'm gonna play this for you. And you're seeing how it's swirling and sometimes it's further north and sometimes it's further south, okay? So we're seeing how that sort of plays out. And then we get to the end of January in here, sorry, the end of December in here when it went back to being farther north of us. And so we got warm conditions, okay? So part of, of what, what we're looking at with climate change is there's a, a lot of, of changing going on in the Arctic regions north of us, okay? And anything that changes in the Arctic is then gonna affect us here in the mid latitudes. So we need to keep an eye out on Arctic changes because they're gonna have a direct influence on us here 
in the mid latitudes here where we live in, in Vermont and New England and the Northeast. Okay, so that's part of what we're looking at as we step through. And what they've realized is these changes that we're seeing in the Arctic regions have sort of ramped up a little bit since about 1980 or so. So we're seeing more of these, these times when we have that cold air coming down towards us from the Arctic and then the warm air coming up from, from, the, from the tropics. So 1980 is a, a critical year if you're trying to put a pinpoint on when are we starting to see some of these things really, really amplify and accelerate, okay? Remember, there's a quiz after. So make a note, 1980. All right, so something else that I know you've probably seen this slide because I've, I've, I've shown it practically every time that I've come here is some of these changes are not just uh, wintertime changes, we're also seeing changes in the summertime and in and the springtime. So that uh, what we know is something called a backward spring, where, you know, around Mother's Day, we've gotten snow in the last couple of years. Okay. And then other times we'll see all of the, the flowers start to bloom and then it snows on top of them. And I'm not talking about a little bit of snow. I'm talking about snow, snow, right? And so when that happens in the springtime, those temperatures and that snowfall is actually opposite to what we would expect it to be. And so we call it a backward spring because it's going backwards to what it should be, right? So if you see any pictures like this this year, please send them to me so I can swap out these because I know you've seen these before, okay? So I need to get some fresh ones if we happen to see any more of these backward springs, okay? All right. So... One way of, of trying to broaden the conversation of where Vermont and New England fits in is, of course, looking across the entire world, the entire globe. And this particular animation, it starts off in, in the 1880s and it goes up until last year. And again, remember that, that, that year that I told you? Look for it when we get to 1980 and you'll see why I pointed that out, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and play this one for you. And, and let it start off in the 1880s, kind of moves on through. And what you're seeing is changes relative to uh, an average time period. Blues mean it's colder than that average. Red means it's warmer than that average. And so we're looking, did you see that 1980? Okay. And what's happened since 1980? We've gone to this pr pronounced tremendous amount of warming, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, all right? And so that time period that they're comparing this to is 1951 to 1980. So colder than that shows up as blue, warmer than that shows up as red. So it begs the question, how can you have warming taking place at the same time as having record snowstorms? And part of the answer to that is when, when we're thinking about warming patterns, warming then leads to the ability to have more moisture in the air. And that's part of the reason why you can get record snowfall because there's more moisture in the atmosphere to actually fall. Now, how can you get record snowstorms? Well, remember all of that uh, changing coming down from the Arctic, okay? You're still gonna get cold air coming down. And so, Nor'easters are still going to happen. Blizzards are still going to happen. So it's not incongruous to have both a snowstorm and warming taking place at the same time. Okay, It's all part of how things are changing and, and the, the dynamics and the processes that are going on. Everybody still with me? Okay. All right. So to, to understand how all of this works, we have to, to remember that all of the things here on Earth are connected. Right? There's nothing that's disconnected from anything else. And another way of saying that is everything is a system. So if I warm up something, that's going to change how much moisture is in the air, which then changes how much rain or snow falls. Seeing where I'm going with this? And if it changes how much rain or snow falls, then that means it's going to change who gets too much rain or too much snow and who doesn't. You see where we're going all of this, right? And so all of this is interconnected. It all has to be a system because there's, there's no sort of like break in there. And anytime you change one thing, it's going to change something else. All right. So we're looking at all of this all together. So all of these changes that we're seeing, whether they are on a global scale, 
whether they are on a regional scale like New England and Northeast, we're seeing a lot of these changes occurring in extreme events taking place region-wide, but also locally. So you're looking at this, you're seeing things like drought conditions, particularly in the western part of the U.S., for example. We're looking at mudslides, we're looking at um, floods taking place. And so part of, of what we do is to try and, and capture this all in one place to understand how these changes are occurring and what that means for us. So during the introduction, you heard that I have been uh, fortunate and privileged enough to participate in the National Climate Assessment. And the fifth National Climate Assessment is going to be released later this year. The fourth National Climate Assessment was released in 2018. And at that time, what we were able to understand were all of the changes here in the Northeast were changing our seasons. They were changing our livelihoods. They were changing things like tourism and recreation. And that has not changed, okay? All of these seasonal changes, all of these changes in our socioeconomic pieces that we depend on, those are still uh, very much subject to change. And so this is one of the pieces that came out in 2018, and it's just as true today in, in 2023. So I like to make things local. So whenever I go and give a talk, I will actually try and find information for that particular place. So here we are on Dorset Street. What was the, the um, address again? 899? So 899 Dorset Street, okay? And South Burlington. So there's a, a, a program called Climate Explorer. And this is where your next set of notes come in. You want to try this. Um, put in a zip code. And what it will give you is the climate of that particular zip code in the past and then what it's projected to do out into the future all right so if you're thinking about how can we plan for our change in climate this is a great website to actually see what it could look like in in a, at a particular zip code all right so it's called climate explorer and so we're, we're looking at, at this particular um, diagram for South Burlington. And I purposely picked, you know, the nighttime temperatures, how, how cold it drops at night? Because I'll let you in on a little secret. That's one of the clearest ways of seeing the effects of climate change, how cold it gets at night, and if we're still getting as cold as we used to get. All right. So that that minimum temperature, that nighttime temperature is one of the clearest signals that we can look at. And so what we're just seeing is it's been getting warmer and warmer at night. Right. So it's not getting as cold as it used to get. And that's going to have um, implications for things like ticks that we used to, you know, expect them to die off over over winter when it got cold enough. If the winters are not as cold as they used to be, then the tick population is not going to be as, as controlled as it used to be in the past. So that's part of the reason why we're looking at, at things that um, are, are critical for, like I said, system. Okay, so you're thinking biology, you're thinking pests, you're thinking species, and temperatures are critically important in that as well. So let's talk a little bit about too much water, too little water. And what it means for us here in the state, um, when we look at things like when snow melt occurs, we've got uh, a decent snowpack out there right now. When that goes, how fast it goes, whether it will lead us to um, flooding a little bit later on, a couple of months time, or whether we won't get any flooding. All right. So the timing and the rate of snow melt is, is something that's important to us here in the Northeast. And we're seeing that it's been shifting a little bit earlier in time. OK. Another thing that we can look at if, if we move from spring to summer is how much rainfall, how much precipitation, how much runoff, how much storm flow. And again, all of those have been increasing over time. So we're seeing that across in here. And here we are in northwest corner of the state here. OK. So the flip side of too much water is not enough water. And droughts in Vermont have a, an interesting history. Because if we look far enough back in time, what you're looking at here, can everybody see the reds, the yellows, the oranges, right? And you're also seeing the blues and the teals. 
All right. So all of the times when we have reds and yellows and oranges, those are times when we've been in drought conditions. And then when you see the, the blues and the, and the greens and teals, it's when we've had excess or a lot of moisture. So you'll notice back in time, Vermont used to be a really, really drought prone place. Do you see that? Okay. Did you know that? We used to have a lot of droughts back in the like the 1910s, 1930s, 1940s. We used to be really, really drought prone. And then things switched and we started to get to be more moisture prone. But it doesn't mean that we no longer have any droughts, right? But droughts are part of our history. And we can look at Lake Champlain and look at Lake Champlain through time 1909, 1927, 1966, and 2011. And each one of these graphs is showing you the height of Lake Champlain, the highest it can ever be. That's this top line here. The lowest it could ever be, that's this bottom line here. The average is the one in the middle. And then the year itself is the one that changes. So this is the line for, two, for 1909. This is the one for 1927 and so forth, okay? So what you're seeing is when the lake level drops to the lowest it can be or close to the lowest it can be, you know that we're talking about drought conditions, right? Because it takes a while, it takes a lot for Lake Champlain levels to drop that low. If you've ever seen pictures in 1909, it's, it's been so low then, you could actually walk out to some of those islands in the lake. All right, so that's what we mean when we talk about being drought prone. So 2011 was interesting. We had Hurricane Tropical Storm Irene in here that set some records. We had the, the spring floods that also set some records in, in May of that year. And here is the, the flooding in 1927 that set those records in here. Okay, so we're looking at that. Everybody got this diagram, okay? Because I'm going to show you what last year looked like. Do you remember anything about last year, whether it was a wet year or a dry year? All, all I'm hearing is <laughs> no, no, no thoughts about last year. Okay, let me show you. This is what last year looked like. Okay. And what what's the word you probably use? Pretty, pretty dry. Yeah. Okay. So the the last year, which is this red line here shows us pretty dry, okay? Getting close to some of the values that were low, the lowest they've ever been, okay? And so we ended off the year still pretty dry. So it means we're still kind of dry right now, okay? So this is one of the reasons why we talk a little bit about not just too much water, but not enough water, okay? So, so here's, here's a, a map from what's called the U.S. Drought Monitor, and it shows you on a week-by-week -week basis where is their drought across the state and across New England, across all of the Northeast. And last week was one of the first times that the state has not been in drought, okay? All of 2022, we were in drought. Pretty much all of 2021, we were in drought as well, all right? So some part of the state was, was in drought, and so if I were giving this talk last year, like October, November last year, we were still in drought. And it was particularly on the eastern side of, of our state that we were in drought. So I did actually give a talk in, in Fairley. And Fairley is one of the towns that is, is interesting because part of the county was in drought and part of it was, was perfectly fine. So when we look at all of these things about weather and climate, where you are is also important. So why am I talking about not enough water? Well, it affects things like plants. It affects things like the crops that we grow. So there was a drought back in, in 2016 here in the Champlain Valley. And I took these pictures. You know where Mazza's fruit stand is in Colchester? Yeah. So I took these pictures just close to where this, this stand is just to, 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 to help me remember how dry the conditions were, how dry the soil was during that particular drought. You'll also see drought... Um, affecting our iconic species, our sugar maples, when they don't turn as brilliant orange and red as they would if there weren't dry conditions. So, so drought's important to us from a socioeconomic perspective. And then one that we don't always think about, 
the impact of, of drought on wildfires. And one of my students is actually doing some work right now to help answer this question. What's the relationship between dry conditions in the state and where and when do we have wildfires? Okay, so it's, it's important to answer that question because again, a lot of our, our economy depends on, 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 on knowing the health of our, our species. So the last piece in drought is there's a new type of drought. It's called ecological drought. And what it allows us to do is to see what we do as humans, what we value as humans, and how that's impacted by drought. So it's, it's the give and take between, you've heard about ecosystem services and things that we value, like um, healthy species, like clean water, like clean air. How does drought affect all of those things? If we're thinking about carbon sequestration, how do uh, healthy species be affected by drought so that they're not sequestering as much carbon dioxide as possible? So this is, this is new and it's critically important for us to also understand how our, our ecosystem is being affected by, by dry conditions. So we've looked at a couple of these and one of the things that you always hear about when you hear about uh, climate change in a state is, the extremes are changing. So if we're looking at extreme conditions, like I said, a lot of times we'll think about uh, floods, we'll think about fires, we're, we're looking at how these affect us um, on a local basis, how they affect things like transportation and, and infrastructure. And that diagram on the lower right here, you might think that was part of, of Vermont, but it wasn't. These were, okay, Irene, back in, in 2011. So what is that now? How many years ago was that? 12 years now, almost 12 years. Yeah, okay. And what, what have we um, learned in terms of lessons learned as a result of Irene? How have we changed our, our, our business practices or our living practices as a, real, a result of having lived through uh, Hurricane Irene? So speaking of hurricanes, why do you think we're talking about hurricanes? Do hurricanes affect us? Was Irene the first? So I'm getting a lot of, no, no. Is that a general? No. Think about hurricanes, thinking about why we need to look at them here in Vermont. And the answer is yes, we do need to look at them here because hurricanes tend to sort of track along the eastern seaboard and then either go up the Champlain Valley in here or they go up the, the Hudson Valley and the Connecticut Valley in here or they'll make a glancing blue. All right. So we've seen that in the past. And when that happens, they do produce a lot of rainfall. And so knowing about hurricanes for us is, is also part of our climate change story because of the amount of precipitation that they're going to bring. So here are some of the, the hurricanes that have sort of moved in that pattern that I've, I've just mentioned, coming along the eastern seaboard and up into either the Connecticut River or the Champlain Valley here, and affecting us by the amount of, of precipitation that was produced. And by looking at all of this precipitation, what we have realized is the amount of, of rain that used to fall in the past is a whole lot less than what falls now. All right. So you see this diagram here? You see all these colors on here? What they're showing you is the amounts of rainfall that, that, that fall that we can use for a planning purpose. If you are a transportation engineer and you need to, to figure out how, how large to, to, to create your culverts, you would look at a graph like this, all right? And figure out where to put a, a culvert that can hold yay amount of water, versus one that needs a whole yay amount of water, right? So this, this is a, a, a graph. It's in what we call geographic information systems or GIS, which means you can actually zoom on in to get how much you need to look at, okay? So this, this is important because see these yellow lines that I just put on here, all right? Those were what we used to use for planning purposes. So we've gone from having only three or four lines and kind of having to eyeball in between to having this, this really super high resolution technology where you can get a, a better value of what you need to plan for when you have to create things like culverts. And now this new technology also has the latest amount of, of rainfall. 
So it's like a win, win, win. Okay. All right. So keeping all of those pieces in mind and thinking about who is most vulnerable, who is at the table, who's not at the table. Those are some of the pieces that I've gotten particularly interested in in the, the, the last few years, particularly during the COVID pandemic, because it was very, very eye-opening to see uh, where climate, climate change and vulnerability pieces were sort of coming together. So in, in looking at that, one question we can ask is, hey, which sectors in Vermont are particularly prone to or susceptible to or vulnerable to our changing climate? So we can do it from a socioeconomic perspective. And so the ones that you may think of would include uh, infrastructure. They might include tourism, agriculture, forestry, human health. Those are some of the things that we think about when we think about what is at risk. That's another way of saying it. What is at risk in terms of our changing climate? And so infrastructure is, is big. It could be critical infrastructure, like power plants, for example. It could be our grid. You know when the temperature gets really, really hot? We don't always think about what happens to the, the electricity on the load, on the wires, and whether it can handle that. All right? So these are some of the elements when we think of infrastructure that are critically important in terms of our changing climate. And because of our history, because of our, our cultural legacy, and I think I've said this in here before when, we, when I've given a talk, you know how a lot of the valleys in Vermont are these sort of V-shaped valleys where the rivers are here and the roads are literally next door because that's the only space that they could have uh, installed the rivers. That sets up another kind of vulnerability that we have from an infrastructure perspective because of, of Ge geography, right? Topography, history, and how all of those sort of come together. So there's some places that are really prone to, to flooding events um, because of that, that positioning of your rivers and your roads next to each other. And we saw that in 1927. We saw that again in Irene. I'm going to blow up the middle of this part here. And so what you're seeing are all of those roads that were affected in 1927. They're the same roads that were affected during Irene. OK, because it's 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 a it's a piece of the landscape. Right. Those roads have not moved uh, in the last hundred years. And so this actually makes it a little bit easier to figure out where we can position position resources because of that proximity to your roads and, and your rivers. So topography is critically important to us here in the Green Mountain State. And as, as we look at that, uh, it's not only for infrastructure, it's also for things like air quality. You know, if you've got valleys like this, and we've got pollution in a valley like this, it's not going to wash out too fast, right? And so understanding our geography, our physical geography, our topography, critically important for us as we think about things like human health in particular. So we're standing here. So the Green Mountains are that way, right? Are the Adirondacks are the other way? If you've ever looked at the Green Mountains on some days and seen sort of like a pea soup, to it. You know what I'm talking about? When the atmosphere has a lot of material in it, it's part of that influence of our geography in here, where things are going to sit and stagnate and where, when do we need to stay inside and when do we need to put out a warning? Okay. So let's talk about us as humans for a sec. And um, part of, the, of, of thinking of, of climate change and us as humans is, is looking to see changes in, you know, when it goes from hot to cold or rain to drought, okay? If we're, if we're seeing more of that um, extreme conditions, which is what you see here. See these squiggles? These squiggles are getting bigger and bigger. So you can see droughts and floods in the same year. You can see cold and, and, and warmth in, this, in the same month, like December, 2022, all right? So when you see these extremes, it puts a pressure on us as humans. And so there's a, a human vulnerability by seeing these extremes. And how does that affect us? So last time I was here, somebody asked me about Lyme disease. And I was not able to provide a response because I didn't have any data at that point. Well, I now do. So if we're thinking of, 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 of incidences of Lyme disease, reports of Lyme disease, on the left-hand side is 1996, on the right-hand side is 2018. And you see, you see, I heard that, 
everybody's like, ooh, do you see that tremendous amount in, in increases of, of cases reported in New England and Northeast, but in Vermont as well? All right. So Lyme disease is one of those that we're looking at uh, in terms of tick-borne diseases and how those change with our temperatures. So that's one element of, of, um, of our changing climate for us as humans. We can also think about temperatures. And I think this is new from the last time I came here. Whenever you hear an alert that there's a heat wave or hot conditions, that threshold is now 87 degrees. It's no longer 90. You know why? Because for us in the Northeast, where we're not acclimated to having 90 degree weather, we start to feel um, challenges at 87. So the, the, the Vermont Department of Health, in conjunction with the National Weather Service, now puts out a warning if the temperatures are going to consistently exceed 87 degrees, okay? Because that's, that's where we see these physio physiological changes to us as humans here in the North Country. So here's a, here, here we are at Banana Belt in the Champlain Valley and seeing how that sort of plays out relative to our colleagues who live in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. They have fewer days, higher elevation, colder uh, values. Uh, and then our, our colleagues down in the um, lower part of the Connecticut Valley here. All right. These are the days of, of how many times does it get above that 87 degrees. Okay. So then came COVID. And the world changed and everything uh, became into clearer uh, focus because now you started to see some of the impacts of our changing climate in conjunction with the impacts on us as human beings. And that's where, like I said, a lot of my thinking sort of changed a little bit in looking at uh, vulnerability as us humans, but also inclusion and, and making sure that we have uh, all of the folks at the table as we move forward as a society. So I'm not sure if you've seen this diagram, but what it is, is it shows, you remember when everything shut down in March of 2020 and industrialization pretty much stopped, we stopped driving, we were all at home for extended periods of time. One of the things that we noticed is one of the gases that is a greenhouse gas did a dramatic decrease as a result of everything being shut down. So as you look at this diagram here, on the upper part is the average conditions. The gas in question is, is nitrogen dioxide. And the more purple or the more black, the higher the concentration of this greenhouse gas. And the more yellow and blue, the lower the concentration. So this is the average on the upper diagram here, 2015 to 2019. And this is March of 2020 when things shut down one month. All right. And you see that dramatic decrease in a, a lot of that gas across pretty much most of the Northeast. Right. So we're looking at, at how the influence of, of, of the COVID pandemic plays out from a, a, a greenhouse gas potential as well. And when we bring us as humans into the, the conversation, and thinking about um, a lot of the things that went on during the, the COVID pandemic, we also had heat waves taking place at the same time, all right? And during the pandemic, you heard things like shelter in place, if there was a heat wave going on. That opened my eyes a lot as a climatologist because if you ask someone to shelter in place and they don't have a home, where are they going to shelter? Does everybody know where the closest and safest shelter is? Okay, does everybody have access? And so it started me really, really um, thinking deeply about vulnerability, about who has access and who doesn't has, have access. Uh, all of our materials in, in uh, languages that everybody can uh, access and understand. Uh, we have uh, thinking about mobility, thinking about uh, if, if folks need to move from one place to the next, all of these are critically important. And I think COVID-19 was this, this sort of like really, really slicing through to, to some of the things that are critically important and, and, and really matter. So who's vulnerable? 
all right? And we think about it both from a cultural perspective, we can think about it from an ability perspective, we can think about it from an age perspective, from a, a housing insecure perspective. These are all things that we need to, to think about in the context of our, of our changing climate because they all go together, okay? So during the pandemic and continuing even to today, we've seen a lot of, of movement of peoples from one place to the next and folks coming into the state, migrating into the state um, for, for a number of reasons, including um, leaving places that may have had more COVID cases where they were. And so we've, we've seen a number of, of COVID migrants coming into the state and that raises the question of, are we prepared are we inclusive? Are we welcoming to folks who are coming in from other places? And so we have um, uh, refugees and, and migrants who are COVID related coming into the state of Vermont. This wasn't only in Vermont. This was sort of, of occurring across the entire globe. And so the World Meteorological Organization who looks at everything that is, is, is meteorologically related actually pinpointed using the, the vulnerability that we saw in COVID to, to, as a springboard to how to change how we do business. And so there's some lessons learned in coming out of how do we provide services that make sure that we have people first, okay? And it wasn't just at the, at the international level, it was also at the national level. So the, the Centers for Disease Control were also in this space at the same time, looking at how changing climate, changing hazards, peoples are all uh, part of the equation of, of moving forward. So that brings me to um, being on, on the Vermont Climate Council. And uh, a lot of, of the, the work that we did in terms of, of writing our very first climate action plan was to think about the environment, to think about the land, to think about us as, as Vermonters, and what do we need to know about and put in place in order to mitigate against and adapt to our changing climate. So one of the committees that helped us with all of this work was called the Just Transitions Committee. And the Just Transitions Committee helped us to understand how to be inclusive. What are some of the best practices in being inclusive so that we don't repeat the mistakes of, of the past? And one of our, our, our subcommittee members um, was Judy Dow, who's an Abenaki elder and scholar. And she created this diagram that she shared with us as, as counselors at the very beginning in helping us to understand the Abenaki way of knowing about the, the land, about our mother planet. And so it was my privilege to actually bring that into the writing up of the plan and sort of set the stage for how do we look at and understand all peoples, all ways of knowing. And it, it led me to create this diagram here that was my way of trying to conceptualize people's land processes, governance, communities, how they all sort of fit together in, in, in a way that kind of makes sense for us to look at our, our changing climate. And how do we present it? How do we talk about it? How do we learn from each other? How do we figure out what we know? How do we figure out what we don't know? And how do we um, move forward with that? Okay, so this is in, in the, the climate action plan itself. So wrapping up here, because I know it, it's always uh, important to end on a, what can you do? Note, right? Because I know I've thrown a lot of other stuff at you here. So let's end on, on what can we do note. And there are two pieces that I'm gonna just sort of highlight briefly. Um, people, people, people. Okay, we need to have people as part of the conversation, whether it's from uh, a governance or a community's perspective, whether it's from an accessibility perspective, we, we, need, to, we need to really put people first, okay? So not, not necessarily the systems, not necessarily the technology, we need to get people in the equation, okay? So that's one piece that's in here. And the other piece is um, maybe thinking back to how can we be more cohesive in terms of, of bringing in land components so whether it's uh, nature-based solutions, whether it's preservation, whether it's all of the things that we do so well as Vermonters, how can we make sure that those are part of how we prepare for, respond to, and adapt to our changing climate? 
So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I thank you for being here. I'd like to thank all the folks who are online on Zoom and turn it back over for any questions that we might have. So thank you again. Thank you so much. So for those of you who are on Zoom, I would like you to ask some questions on Zoom. Go into Q&A. If you have a computer, you should find that bar at the bottom. If you have an iPad, it would be at the top. And under Q&A, type in your questions. We just have one so far, so we're looking for more. Okay, so while we wait for folks online to um, add to your questions, that was a challenge. You would like to see more than one question. Yeah. Any questions in the room? Hi, yeah. Um, I have noticed this winter that even though it wasn't maybe that cold, that it was often windy. I mean, I live right in Burlington, so, and I don't think it's always just wind off the lake either. I think it's north winds, south winds, and um, it feels colder because of the wind, and also there's more dampness in the air. It, what was the last part of it? Was there's there's more dampness in the air. Ah. It doesn't feel. Uh, it used to be that you could have a cold, dry day, and it just was nice and crispy and very tolerable. But now it seems we're having more, not so cold but wet and damp. Okay, so not so cold but wet. So there's there's a, a change in in the moisture in the air. Yeah, the dampness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the wind. How about what? Ha what's where did that wind come from? Right. So one one of the things that we know about the the Champlain Valley is it tends to be windy, particularly as you get further north of us. So as you get towards Saint Albans, it gets even windier because what happens with wind? There are two things that happen with wind. The big open expanses where it's flat are perfect for having a lot of you know like big events like tornadoes, most of the tornadoes in Vermont are actually in that flat part near to St. Albans. But you also get a lot of winds whenever you have obstructions. Because if you have an obstruction, the wind is forced to, to blow between the obstruction. So think about valleys. Think about um, tall buildings, right? So we're, we're in between the dacks and the greens. So naturally the wind flows either from the south to the north, or vice versa, from the north to the south. So anytime you get either an obstruction or you get a large open area, you're gonna to tend to see a lot of winds. And what winds do is they cause us to feel colder because they move the heat away from our body. So if, if the winds are faster, we lose heat faster, so we feel cold faster. So that's part of what you're seeing. now. Dampness has to do with how much, how sticky the air is, right? And so if the, if the winds are coming from the south or if they're coming from the lake or the, the ocean, they're gonna tend to have a little bit more moisture in them. And so one of the things you can check to see is on those damp days, if you notice there are certain time or certain weeks, we can go back and, and see where the winds were coming from because that would help us to figure out where the moisture was particularly in the winter time. Yeah. We have several questions suddenly on Zoom. <laughs> so I'll start with the first one. Um, on the slide entitled NOAA Atlas 14, okay. 24, 100 year return period rainfall. There are two areas in Connecticut where there are unusually high rainfall. These two areas do not appear to be in a mountainous area. What might be causing this higher rainfall? Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing the, the two regions were in here, where the bullseye was the eight inches, and we're looking at this, this part across in here. Um, pardon? Was Connecticut. Okay. Where there are unusually high rainfall. Two areas. So around the Torrington region here. I wonder where the other region is. 
and wondering why mm. higher rainfall. Mm -hmm. So without having the, the overlay, the underlay show up really well, if you look really closely, we, there's the topography right underneath here. It's not um, crisp enough for me to see if there's an orographic or a topographic um, influence going on. Uh, what I would have to do is to, if, if the person who asked the question wouldn't mind sending me an email, I'll be able to follow up online because it's either topographic or there's something to do with how the air flows onto the land right around there. Okay. Mm -hmm. How is the change of spring impacting maple sugar production? Oh, that's a million dollar question, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that one, um, I will also have to do some digging on because the, the, the changes that you're seeing are not just in whether it gets as cold as it used to, but it's also the shifting in the seasons. If it's shifting a little bit earlier, um, shifting a little bit earlier and then temperature drops again. So the sap sap starts to flow. And so I think that's one of the biggest challenges for sugar makers, sugar makers right now, whether they continue to tap or not, uh, whether the yields are going to be the same, whether the, the, the flavor is the same, whether the grades are the same. And I think there's a lot of, of work going on at the Procter Maple Research Center and other places trying to answer those questions because they're non-trivial. I, uh, I found a quote from uh, Bill McGibbon it's about agricultural practices, you know, up here at UVM. It says, shifting from feedlot farming to rotational grazing is one of the few changes we could make that's on the scale as the problem of global warming. It won't do away with the need for radically cutting emissions, but it could help get the car exhaust you emitted back in high school out of the atmosphere. Okay, so those are some of the, the agricultural practices that are, are currently being explored. And I think a, a, a lot of it is um, trying to capture before it even gets emitted into the atmosphere. How do you capture that back into the ground itself? And it, it sort of plays into carbon sequestration and making sure that our species are healthy enough to adequately um, store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, there was something that I saw last night that said there might be a threshold beyond which um, species are not able to continue to sequester carbon. I wasn't able to read it through completely, but that's yet another piece as things evolve and continue. And science is so iterative that every day there's a new study that comes up with yet another piece in the puzzle. And so um, carbon sequestration and looking at uh, agricultural practices is, is huge. So this, the, the state, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service are actively putting together um, some, some plans, some committees and some strategies to continue working in, in that area because it's one of the things where you can actually do both mitigation and adaptation um, depending on the practices that you employ. This is connected with that. Is it true the carbon levels are lessening in the atmosphere? How does that affect the planet if true? So carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, uh, as far as I know, has not con has not declined in the atmosphere. Um, carbon dioxide is what we call a long lived gas. So it stays in the atmosphere for extended periods of time. And even if we were to stop producing um, greenhouse gases today, there would still be continued warming going on because of the gases that are already present and the fact that they're still going to continue warming the atmosphere. So it's, it's what we call inertia. And that's part of the reason why it's making sure we try to mitigate as well as adapt to. Do you have recommendations for political changes to address or mitigate the climate crisis? This might be a hot button, but. <laughs> um, I think it, it goes back to, to being on the council and being able to provide the best science possible to help inform policies. It also goes back to being on so many other committees around the state because it allows me to uh, bring that also at the local level. So it, it's sort of like a sandwich helping all different levels to, to make changes and to set up policies to change governance. So I, I worked with a, an individual town last semester. So it's, it's interesting to see how well you can actually help 
shift things at both levels. Congratulations. <laughs> Can you offer some future projections Im uh, about immigration to Vermont on the immigration? So that is a perfect segue to Dr. Pablo Bose, who will be coming here in two weeks' time. And whoever asked the question, I'm sure uh, Pablo would be able to answer it a whole lot better than I would. Okay, that sounds good. Do you have any, any more questions? I have some more if you don't. But... More on the floor. This is awesome. We usually don't have many on Zoom. So. Oh, lovely. Mary? Yeah, what do we do about invasive species? Oh, goodness. What do we do about invasive species? I mean, aren't they part of the story? They are indeed. And invasive species um, right. are challenging because once they take root, a lot of them can outcompete the, the native species. And so I think when you, you're talking about invasives, it, it has to do with either whether they're um, insect or species or in the lake or so on. What are the types of strategies that could be Im implemented? And so that gets into uh, more biological pieces of the, the land and the environment that are a little bit outside of my bailiwick. So I don't want to make a recommendation or suggestion that might be inappropriate. So the fellow who sent in the question about Connecticut just said he meant New York. <laughs> and so I know this person, but I won't say anything. Uh -huh. um, and you are being recorded, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Southwest of Albany, that's what he meant. The two, I see exactly what he's now saying on your map, that those two areas. These two areas. Yeah, because right. that, that's what I would have thought when, when I heard yes. Bullseye and two, <laughs> two areas. And everybody in the room was telling me, no, you need to go. <laughs> so these two areas here. Yes. Okay. I still need to look at the geography. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to. So to make sure that we yes. have this on tape, that it's yes. these two areas. These areas. Okay. One more question. Um, you said the threshold for a heat wave and an alert is now at 87 degrees, where it used to be at 90. If we look at last year, there were 18 days that reached 87 or higher in Chittenden County. What was the number of days at 90 last year? Oh, dear. I get another question where probably less. <laughs> no, 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 not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Because what what could happen is they could be non consecutive. Yeah. Right. And so if if the person who asked that question sends me an email, it's just a quick thing to run a okay. script and find that out. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. I think we're all set. This has been such Oh, wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you.